The story so far, I am porting Fusix to the ESP8266. I am successfully booted the kernel, I have a file system with user land binaries in it, I'm loading the binaries, and enough stuff is working that I'm actually getting a login prompt, which is nice. We don't have any interrupts yet, which is showing up on the list of things to do. And uh, frankly, right now the boot up speed is too slow. So if I hit the reset button on the board, here it's booting. So it's loaded in it, it's now going through the startup procedure, and it's painful. Frankly, this is unusably slow. I think that half the trouble is that it's doing lots of swapping to the flash, and I think the NAND flash is rather slow. But we need to do something about this. So while that continues, the simplest thing to do is to simply increase the clock speed. Now, there are two clocks on the system. One is the CPU clock, which is set here. Uh, this can be set to various different values. I'm not sure if it can be scaled arbitrarily. Uh, I have found some really useful example code here. Uh, which configures all this. Um, and I also need this file. So here are the various configurations you can use. This is the main clock. This is the secondary clock. The secondary clock, the peripheral clock, is used to control the speed of the peripherals, obviously enough. And I don't know what the default peripheral clock speed is. If it's slow, that will slow down all access to the, to the NAND flash. The NAND flash is a SPI device, so uh, it's serial input and output. So that will be approximately 10 clocks per byte. So the we, I'm using the default value of 52, which is this top one, and not touching anything else. So let's see if we can crank this all the way up. Ah, and here we have our Getty, our startup banner, and our login prompt. We don't have any TTY input yet, so we can't do anything, but it's got there. It took several minutes to do so. All right, so... be CPU clock. Here we have to configure the UART's uh, own clock, which is based on... I thought this was going to be based on the CPU clock, actually, but maybe it's the peripheral clock. Well, there is one way to find that out, which is fairly straightforward. Okay, so this should... type correctly. Here we go. So this should do exactly the same thing with nothing's changed. We've just fiddled with the code slightly. So can we put this... Okay, we've got, C we've got serial output, so that is working. So let's change this to 80 and see what it does. And the answer is, it's garbage. So I'm going to guess that that's based on the peripheral clock. OK, let's take a look at the code in here that actually sets up the clocks. There is a surprising amount of it. So 
In order to configure the peripheral clock, you need to configure a PLL, a programmable logic loop, essentially a programmable digital clock. And some of the more exotic configurations require this. Uh, some configurations allow us to require overclocking. This, I think, doubles the clock speed. So, actually, there is one thing I want to do first. Let's try this. So this should keep the UART based at uh, the 56 megahertz clock. Yep, yeah, okay, that's working. So we've managed to increase the CPU clock, but we've left the peripheral clock as it is. So we should be able to crank the CPU clock up as much as we like, but uh, I don't honestly think we care about that too much. I'm not entirely certain I understand this code. So that all these clock rates, it's setting the CPU clock to 80. So unless that is then modified by the PLL code, which is up here, So if we want to increase the peripheral clock speed, we want to set it to 80. Then we do need to set up the PLL. Although if we go through here, if we set them if you set it to 52, it never calls setup PLL. Uh, is there anything in here? I don't think there is. There isn't. Okay, so... If we go for 80, then we have to set up the PLL and set the clock speed to 80. And then configure the UART to the peripheral clock speed. So, to set up the PLL, that is this code. This is reading from the system configuration whether uh, what clock crystal is being used. With these modules, it's always 26 megahertz, apparently. So we, we can just ignore this. This code's commented it out. So... This should configure the clock to 80. You can also get 160.
Okay, this is configuring Yeah, uh, what this is doing is it's sending values out to the I squared C bus and there'll be a whole bunch of random peripherals attached to this. I believe that 4 comma 1 is configuring the peripheral clock and 4 comma 2 the CPU clock, maybe. So According to the documentation, this sets it to 80 megahertz. Now that will fail to build because we don't have the I squared C write reg. Uh, is that defined here? It's not. I think that's defined here. This is Pico I squared C right reg asm, but this code is calling just right reg. Okay, so this is defined to just call the ROM routine. Which is the one we want, to be honest. The Pico 66 configuration doesn't use ROM routines where possible. But we want to use them where possible. And is it called right reg? Yes, it is, and it's at that address. So we want to steal this, stick it in here. Stand void. ROM I squared C right reg and uh, we want to add a reference here note the capital R and right reg ROM I squared C right reg equals here This file is the uh, the startup code. This gets loaded into instruction RAM by the ROM bootloader. Uh, we run it and then discard it. So it's a good place to put this kind of configuration. So with luck, this will configure the peripheral clock to 80 megahertz. And it, that means that the UART should work. or not. Well, it's printing something, it's running.
So why do we need to do this as well? Yes, we do. Okay, so we should now have faster... The, the peripheral clock is a bit faster. Can we get it faster still? I can't actually tell whether this is noticeably faster or not. I should have done some timings. So ideally we want it as high as possible, so... Alright, so this is configuring the CPU clock, including this thing for overclocking. Uh, the CPU clock needs to be higher than the peripheral clock, otherwise there's, you know, no point. It's not exceptionally faster. So if you change this to AC1, hundred and eighty-nine. Does this work? Apparently it does. Okay. Okay, let's try the CPU clock. Now there's this thing which sets bits to do with overclocking which clearly this doubles the system clock so we have to this this is commented out So this is setting up the PLL, we've got the code to do that, but then it's just setting the CPU clock to 80, which we are doing. So we should be running at 189 megahertz for the CPU clock. Do we need overclocking bit? No. Well, it's not noticeably faster. Is this as high? This is as high as we can get the peripheral clock. but we could try and get the CPU clock higher. Okay, I need to try and duplicate what this does in my own code. Uh, and that, of course, is just doing nothing. Okay, D port base adder.
is find somewhere here it is this address All right that is just a fixed address so we can do do this uh, looking at our linker script it is defined here as d port 0 seg wonder why those are external we're not using those or that or any of that that's probably used by the bootloader. Cash after W trap null. Interesting. I should go look up what those are. Okay. Um, so we've got this, which means that we can just steal the relevant bit of code so if we want it looks like 346 is You actually use the clock speed anywhere? No, it doesn't. So, in fact, these all work at the same speed. So we've configured this to hopefully 189. And we don't need anything else, assuming this is right. So I think the only thing we can really do is do this to enable the overclock bit and try it and see. Okay, that's interesting. So the UART's working but it's failed to talk to the flash. So enabling this has in fact broken a uh, flash access. This does seem to be tinkering with the bottom bit of that register. Okay, I do not know what this is doing. There's a reference to this code. So let's look it up and see what there is.
it's very Russian. Configure the flash. I wasn't aware that was a thing. Do we need to set the flash to high speed mode? This is the exception handler stuff we dealt with ages ago. Wi Fi stuff we're not using. Set the PLL. Set 80 megahertz PLL CPU. Uh, that's writing both values. 136 is 88. And 145 is uh, 91. And according to this table, 91 is 80 megahertz stock. This allows you to overclock the system. Okay, nothing terribly useful there. But I am curious about this SBI flash config. So, this does look like a speed parameter. And there's another one here. Okay, well, let's just try copying this over and see what it does. I uh, probably want both of these. And honestly, the flash idle thing. Okay, so flash chip is actually defined here we don't have flash config config Um, I don't think that's in ROM. Four, five, six, eight. Ah. Okay. So this disassembly doesn't know what it is. Well, let's add that. Right, SPI flash config at that address, and the other one was read mode config.
which is at this address. I should do a look up and find out what these, see if anyone actually knows what these do. Um, and we do need some prototypes. SPI frag. Hmm. And the other one was SPI read mode config. Is here. All right, what does this do? Um, yeah. And these are not in the interesting. Ah, uh, the naming scheme used by this code uses capital SPI, but we're using the other one. So this is, whoops, what's this? Okay, that got nowhere. So let's comment out one of these, both of these, and see if that works. Hang on. No ampersand. There would have been a warning produced, but uh, it Warnings aren't very helpful with this code because it just like scrolls off the top instantly. Okay, that works. So let's turn these back on and see if it makes a difference. I wonder if the flash is actually running in some really slow mode. Uh, that's not better. See, this is setting it to Five SPI mode five SPI modes. I don't think this is the kind of mode that it's talking about. Yeah, I think this is it. Uh, so, it only goes up to threes. Well, we can set it to five and see what happens. That's no faster. fails, try random web searches. I don't see anything particularly obvious. It's just a reference to a thing we've already seen. Uh, what about SBI flash config? I 
Again, nothing much. Let's try it spelt correctly. Aha! That's irrelevant. Okay, this is... This is all spurious stuff. This is talking about a flash tool. So, SPI read mode config. Nope, nothing. Okay, I have no idea whether that helped. It's still looking dead slow. We've improved the clock speed. At least I think I've improved the clock speed. It's not helping, but uh, I will going to have to go away and do a bunch of research to figure out what's going on with this. And I'm not going to do that online. Okay. A subject change. A thing that occurred to me as soon as I finished the last video is that the stuff I did to implement trim is all wrong. Like, completely, hopelessly wrong. What's happening is uh, device zero is the the hard drive, the flash. It gets routed through the block device layer. The block device layer then calls the callbacks that are set here. Transfer CB is the the only one so far. This then actually does the underlying read or write. Now. The thing that's wrong is that the block device layer is translating between the uh, the sector that's been asked for and the sector on the underlying physical device. And my ioctal routine here is not. Minor here can refer to any partition on the disk, but this is always uh, working in terms of absolute sectors on the on the flash partition. So, the sector we are in fact trimming is just random garbage. I'm amazed it hasn't actually corrupted anything. Well, maybe it has and we haven't noticed. So, I'm going to have to undo things and add add support for the trim ioctal to the block device layer rather than bodging it in. So instead of dev flash ioctal we want um, trim cb And this is nothing. This is block op LBA. Okay, we want to add our call back here that's going to fail because the block device does not have a trim so we're going to have to add it so dev Look, dev h so we create a function prototype and Add the field to the block dev structure. This should build now. 
Yep. And now we need to add into the block dev code itself here in ioctal. Uh, Eight et. We're going to have to put in shift width equals four, tab space equals eight. So if it's flush, we do that. If it's trim, we fail. And if it's anything else, we fail. So what we're going to have to do here is do the translation, which happens in this code. Wondering the best way to do this. Um, I think I need to create a uh, right all this wants is input is the partition which we get take from the minor so that just wants minor uh, in return, we want a simple success fail code. Which we want to be an int. This code goes up here. This goes here. Print fast eight t partition equals so this will translate block op according to the value of partition. Where is the partition used? Right. Partition, the partition variable is only used by the translation code. So we can actually lose this completely. Here we say if we fail to translate the minor fail OK. So that should build, it does not build. Um, because I have not done that. Okay, so this needs to be, if defined config trim, oh. Uh, okay, so this isn't right. So it's read the partition table. We return one if translation fails.
that looks right, actually. What have I done wrong? So the uh, the minor device, as each device is referred to by a 16-bit value, the top 8 bits is the major, which indicates what device it is. That's the offset into here. The, uh, the bottom 8 bits is... Uh, it can be anything depending on what the uh, the major device wants, but the block device driver uses the top four bits to indicate what block device it is. So this is pulling out the uh, the top four bits from the minor and getting a reference to the block device to put into block dev. This is pulling out the bottom four bits that tells us what partition it is. So yeah, one on error, zero on failure. I broken trim? Don't think so. A uh, trim, ioctal. Have I broken ioctal? That has not printed anything here. Is it actually calling block dev transfer? No, it's not. Is it calling block dev ioctal? No, it's not. Okay, thanks to the magic of undo buffers, let us unwind all this code 
and just double check that this is working. Okay, we've broken something else. Good. Uh, probably... Ah, oh, I know what's happened. I know what's happened. I changed the header and didn't clean. So let's try this. Because the, the size of block dev changed, but not all the... Yep, yeah, there we go. It is still not printing anything. That's because we haven't saved. Uh, not all the source files have been rebuilt with the updated block dev size. So heaven knows what was going on. Okay, we're translating lots of stuff. Good. So down here in Ioctal, I believe that this code is safe to common out for all ioctals. I don't think there's any situation where we, we yeah, where we can be called with a invalid minor. So what we want to do is call trim But first we need to set up the, we need to set up LBA. Now, char data. So uh, the argument for Ioctal is a pointer to user code. Normally we don't have to worry about the difference between user and kernel code. But we're an ioctal in generic code, so we do have to think about such things. Uh, so that's happening in syscallfs.c. So I, what I'm wondering here is whether the value is actually read for us before being passed on to the block device driver. I don't think it is. So dioctal is in devio.c dioctal is just being passed straight through. So we need to uh, so the block number is a long in user code so you get L do we need to check that probably not it's pretty harmless So we fetch the LBA, we translate it according to the minor, uh, if we successfully translated it, and let's actually put this here. If we successfully translate it, we just call trim. 
So trim should be being called with the correctly translated LBA sector. Uh, void value not return, yes. This wants to return an error code. Uh, dev flash here, our trim wants to return zero. This is translate LBA. So let's see what it says. This is it translating. It'll only start trimming later on. So partition two is the file system. Partition 1 is swap. So you can see it reading stuff and then swapping it out. Right, now it's reading and trimming the swap. It's probably now garbage collecting. Okay, I reckon that's working. Or at least working more. So what is there to check in? Uh, dev uh, platform dev. I think that's all. So we've got the block dev stuff, new translate function, okay, let's commit that. Okay, uh, now, in terms of the boot process, we need to add some files that were missing from the file system. Remount is one. That's the one that was preventing the file system from being mounted read-write. I don't know how I managed to avoid getting that in, but let's just do that. Uh, set date is here as well. So that will allow that to be called. Set date won't actually do anything in this. Don't actually know what it does. Okay, it prompts for the time, I believe. Given that the next thing we have to work on is uh, TTY, that's no bad thing. So can we update the flash? Yes, we can. And let's write that. 
but we can't because this is still in use. Right, now we write it. Okay, right, while that is running, let's take a look at the TTY stuff. Now, our TTY is here, it's pretty simple. All we do is that whenever a character shows up to be written, we simply use the ROM routine to write it out. We do not want to use the ROM routine, we want to use, well we could use the ROM routine, but we need a interrupt driven TTY so that we can receive characters. For this to work we're going to need interrupt handling. So in fact we might as well just work on the timer first. and I have not done any look, any research on how timers work. Luckily I've got the Arduino stuff here and there it does have some timer code. So we should just be able to replicate some of this code and see what it does. We seem to be using what I suspect to be a countdown timer as the actual timer. Timer 1, timer 0. It's two timers. There'll be a configurable timer and the system timer. I think timer 0 is going to be our system timer. We have the interrupt handler here, which if a user timer is set, then it turns interrupts all the way off, calls it and puts it back again. That's not complicated. And to set it up, all we do is we attach our ISR. I assume it's configured somewhere or not. Okay, so attaching happens via ETS ISR attach, which sounds like a ROM routine. ETS ISR attach. Yep. And we are, that's not the same thing as an exception handler. All right, so Param1 is the argument so that we get to pass in a arbitrary argument. That's going to be void star user and then an exception frame which would allow us to do preemption if we wanted to do preemption which we don't.
So empty ISR and let's do ETS ISR attach ETS C compare zero inum timer ISR null. Okay, that should be enough to write that wrote. Does that build? Of course it doesn't because we're missing some stuff. So this is our peripheral file and I know that the definitions here do not necessarily match the uh, the ones the Arduino uses. So let's see. Is don't think there's anything. Hey, it's a random number generator. Cool. Yeah, I don't think this has got anything we terribly care about. So what we're going to have to do is go over here to our ROM routine and copy some of this in. Uh, we also want... Attach. attach, which is defined here. And int handler is Here, that's nothing exciting. So I think that is that's wrong. I think that's all we need. Uh, no, it's not. Yes, our interrupt handler is not does not take a null. It takes a struct exception frame. And we now need to add the routine address right so with luck this will actually call our interrupt handler we won't be able to tell it's done anything but everything is running okay so let's now do something incredibly stupid which is Which is uh, I think it's called IRQ flags T disable interrupts print a character turn the back on again the, the uh, this architecture has nested interrupt priorities that was faster that was lots faster. Interesting. It's got nested uh, interrupt priorities, so while the timer ISR is running, other interrupts can be executed. So we use this to turn them all off completely because uh, we don't care about any of that. Okay, now let's see what happens. Hopefully lots of cues.
no cues. This suggests that the this is not being executed. So do we actually have to configure the comparator? Uh, timer not interrupt is six. Yeah. Timer not read, timer not write. Ah. Do we need to enable it? Yes, we do. So that calls ETS inter enable, which is here. So we want to, well, there's mask and unmask here. So here in main, after enabling the interrupt, we want to we want to unmask it. Like that, we also want our addresses, which are here. ETS ISR unmask, and we want mask two, which is at F nine eight. Okay. Queues. Now the system should actually be running. It's going to be spam solid printing queues, but this should all be happening sometime in the background. Uh, I don't know how to configure. Hang on, let's be a bit cleverer, shall we? should slow down the rate of Q production. I want to see if the system is continuing to run even though we're taking interrupts. So I want the queues to be slow enough. Uh, I don't think that's working. Okay, all that's doing is printing queues, nothing else. I wonder if we actually need to clear the interrupt. So here is the interrupt handler. All this does is Yes, at the minimum, this does nothing. If timer not user CB is not set, then the interrupt handler is completely empty. So, So interesting.
It may be the K put char is doing bad things, so let's just turn that off. We don't need the, that anymore, which we know that the interrupt handler is being taken. And nothing happens. All right, let's leave it masked. And it runs. Let's try unmasking it but not attaching it. So this will be taking the default interrupt handler in the ROM. And it doesn't run. Okay, uh, I think we have to configure this somehow. I think what's happening is that the timer is not being set and as a result the system spending all of its time running the timer. Uh, I was expecting to see calls to this somewhere but uh, well when in doubt let's read the documentation. This is a it's not a comparator So this is writing to special register compare zero. Cycle count compare registers. That's not very helpful. Time uh, interrupt, maybe? Yes. Okay, what does this do? Gen periodic interrupts from 32 bit counter to 32 bit comparators. Seek out increments in every processor clock cycle. Timer interrupter cleared by writing C compare. So I th think we need to read the C count special register, add on a constant and then write to C compare for the next timer. Okay. Well. As a volatile read special register C count equals address C count to few operand oh okay so this would read C count then we want to write back write to special register C compare zero a value which is C count plus a million. And do an e sync, whatever an e sync does. One e sync is a float. Writing it out the long way is an integer. Okay, so this should trigger one every million cycles. It's running now. Okay, so now let's do our put char q.
there you go. Interrupts are running. Uh, that has stopped because we're doing garbage collection, I believe. Should come back to life in a bit, I hope. Or it's just crashed and hung. I think it's crashed and hung. Fantastic. Um, I know. I might know. I probably don't know. We're doing all our flash reads and writes with the with interrupts turned off, and this is a cycle counter. Oh. I wonder if what's happening is that when we are touching the flash with the interrupts off, the C count here is incrementing up past C compare, the timer is not firing, and then when interrupts are turned back on again, we have to wait for the clock timer to cycle all the way around our 32-bit counter before it fires again. It doesn't really explain why nothing else is happening. It did just seem to hang and then crash. Um Double exception is in ROM code. Not very helpful. Let's try it without the kput char. Uh, trying to write to the serial port from inside an interrupt handler is a really stupid idea. But this will tell us If this runs normally, then this is what the problem was. I have to say, okay, that, that is running better. So I'm going to put this down to... Uh, I'm going to put that crash down to running kput jar from inside the interrupt handler. All sorts of terrible things could have been happening. Might even have been turning interrupts back on again. Okay, so we have a working interrupt handler. We can adjust the period by changing this value here. So we want to call uh, where's our code? We want to call timer interrupt. Uh, and in fact, this is not really the right place to initialize both these things. This now I rem now I remember this should be happening. Uh, I don't like that. I uh, hate that should have reached the prompt by now. This should be happening in device in it, which should be in here. Where is device in it called? Right, device init is called from the physics core, so we should do that.
Yeah. Yeah, you see here we're initializing the flash. So this should go here. This should go here. And all of this should go here. I think that's not working. Let's try that with interrupts mask, shall we? And set up our... Okay, this is our stopwatch. So it's loading in it. It should start printing messages soon. It doesn't seem much better, to be honest. We have just written back the file system. There we go. Right, so that's a about 30 seconds. So, problem is the timing is so variable due to garbage collection that I'm not sure this test is valid. So, we need to well, this is a cycle counter, so we need to know how fast the CPU was running, which we have in here. So I'm going to have to switch these things out to other code. Put these in globals.h as hash defines. They are just advisory. That's been way more than 30 seconds. doesn't have a second hand. Very useful. Okay, so that's a minute and a half and we haven't hit the prompt yet. So, uh, somewhere in here we have ticks per sec, which is the clock speed. which is defined, it's used in start.c to configure yeah so in order to configure this we want So, it's a 
cycle counter, therefore it's a clock CPU megahertz per second. So per second, per tick, it is this many. So it will be this, and on every interrupt we want to call timer interrupt. Very uncomplicated, however this isn't working. Let Some tracing in. So we want to read page P, write page P, and let's try this. This wants to be CPU clock. And that's no longer a thing. Okay, lots of block reads and writes. It is doing file systemy things. That looks like garbage collection, to be honest. When it's, it goes long spews of read and writes with similar numbers. Uh, I don't know, it could be anything. The numbers do look kind of weird. So uh, one thing I am relying on with this is ISR attach to n to have the C shim in place in order to call timer functions, well uh, interrupt handlers. Like it's got we have to save all the registers and stuff like that. So I'm hoping that's happening. I didn't see anything in the Arduino code to say it wasn't. So here is our interrupt handler. It's just a normal function. Uh, this is an annotation to tell it not to put it in the flash because with the Arduino code it wants to be able to take interrupts while f doing manual flash operations, but we don't care about that. Or at least we don't care about that yet. It is doing a lot of stuff. Okay, let's turn that off and let's do some slightly... Uh, let's do that instead, shall we? This will give us a higher level view of what's going on. Or it won't. Did I break something? I don't think I broke anything. Uh, 
Have we corrupted the file system? Is my trim code broken? I think we've corrupted the file system somehow. Intriguing. Very intriguing. Okay, well... I don't think there's anything wrong with this code. This is the translation code. Here is Ioctal. We fetch the block number. It's a long, it's 32 bits in this platform. We translate it and we call trim. There's not really anything to it. Block dev needs to be set up correctly, but we've done that. That happens here. From the miner. Well, let's write that flash back again. and give it another try. And if it works, we will see what happens. I'm still unhappy about the behavior with the clock. Uh, timer interrupt is not complicated. It's in process.c. Uh, it increments the uh, the per process timers that indicate um, that tell the system how long the process has been running for. I'm just looking at this in swap. Are we actually? So most of our swap code runs with interrupts on. Because we don't have to worry about preemption. This is the code that does preemption if it's there, which is not for us. So in swap happens here. Swap in. So this is the simple swap routine. So it does appear to be running swap in with in swap not set. Is that correct?
I'm not sure that's correct. So let's stick some tracing in our own swapper. Like this. And the flash is finished, so let's run it. Okay, so we've got system calls. Okay, swap out has happened. In swap is seems to be zero a lot of the time. I suppose if the UData block gets modified during swap going out, then and we get a prompt really quickly. Interesting. Very interesting. I wonder if what we were seeing was just a garbage collection time. Um, but I think I want to inquire about that. You can see the fork is pretty slow. So this is a swap in as we trim lots of stuff. Um, long pause probably caused by a swap out. I mean, there's lots of space for it now. This copy routine seems to be called during garbage collections a lot, so let's do that. Lots of copies. Honestly, I am thinking that the flash is just not worth it. I think it's too slow and too problematic. Swapping to SD card is fine, as they seem to be way faster. So I'm annoyed that I never got the SD card code to work. That's better. Yes, it's the trailing colon in the mode line that makes the difference. Um, I don't like the way that's just sort of stopped. It does seem to be that the it's the clock code that makes the difference.
So this is the timer code. So we read C count Why is that static? Yeah. I think that's just stopped. Yeah, that's definitely a garbage collection. So here's a disassembly of our ISR. We're reading C count. We're loading the pre-computed constant from here. We're writing it back to C compare zero, e-sync, call timer interrupt, turn interrupt back on, i-sync, return. And that stopped again. I hope this isn't a recurrence of that crash we were seeing. I would be expecting uh, see if this was going back to user code I would expect to be seeing a message to say so. Is it actually finishing a swap? I think that what I need to do is to sit down and try and make the SD card stuff work somehow. Uh, my board actually has a little screen on it, which will be hooked up via... Well, I think it would be hooked up via SPI. But I think it may be happening in another set of pins. It's, it's very poorly documented. So it's possible it's a board problem. I should just order another one without the screen on it. I mean, it's not like they're expensive. Um, because I think trying to swap to the internal flash is just going to be a recipe for disaster. The interesting thing is that while it's talking to the flash, I do see the little blue light on the f top of the device flicker. But that loop blue light shouldn't be attached to any of these GPIO pins, so I don't know why it's doing that. I was hoping today that I would get as far as trying to make the TCY work. That will require a bit of research and probably stealing more code from the Arduino source base. But the main thing it needs is the ability to reliably get to a program that tries to use the TCY, and I don't think it's going to do that. So I think I'm going to need to spend some serious time on the SD card. Yeah, this is... Uh, 
stopped again. Blue light is not flickering. Oh, there we go. See, this looks like file system stuff. Do you see all the random... No, no, sorry, that's more garbage collection. File system stuff, if it was modifying... Uh, well, if it was deleting files, we would see random trim requests. But these are consecutive, so this is a garbage collection. Okay, so that's swapped in a process, but then it's just stopped. It's not returned to... Uh, it's not returned to user mode, because we would be seeing the syscall exit trace. So it's produced this message, but is not proceeding further. Interesting. Swapper happens from switch in, which is in tricks.s. Switch in is here. Here is where it calls swapper. So this is when it's rescheduling the process. This does slightly look like a recurrence of our old problem. It could be that we've run out of stack again, because now, of course, uh, we've got the Now, of course, we've got the interrupt handler, which can randomly start allocating stack at any moment. And if that overflows, it will randomly scribble over bits of kernel workspace. I think this architecture uses lots of stack. So it's... There we go, login prompt. I think it just ran out of stack. We've got way too many of these weird little buffers and stacks. Um, the U block is now one and a half K. The swap stack is now one and a half K. Uh, this is all going to add up. Where have we got to in terms of memory usage? Um, we've got everything between heap start and C O O O so that is under a kilobyte free. We do have a big chunk of memory above the the ROM workspace where the boot stack used to go, which we're not using. So we may be able to reclaim some of that. That would be nice. But ideally, I would like to be able to uh, have as many buffers as possible. The other thing which could be wrong is this stuff. If I have accidentally... Uh, configured something in some very slow mode. Um, what does this show up? References to the SDK. 
does always seem to be setting this WB trap null. So I think that could be right. Okay, let's turn this off. Turn this off. And we want to lose that and lose that. Um, our clock is running. those warnings. I can fix that for a start. Uh, this is a generic pointer. And let's see what this does. Yeah, um, so we've got this segment which is ROM workspace. Why can't it? Oh, we can't create var run new temp because we never created the uh, var run, that's why but it is creating the mtab file. There we go. The problem is that uh, the actual usage of this workspace is not very well understood. So I have to be careful about how much of it I actually use in case I write on top of something else. But it's well known that there is at least several k's worth of stack so we could trivially use that as the swapper stack, for example. And that would save, you know, one and a half K from the kernel workspace, which is enough for three whole buffers. Okay, I'm going to call this done. Uh, done, done some major fixing. We've done some investigation. Uh, the timer works, although it's not obvious that it has worked. Um, so we're in a good position to try and get the TTY stuff working. But I think that I will have to go and investigate how the SD card works and order another ESP8266 board. Fun. I hope you've enjoyed this video and as usual, please let me know what you think in the comments.